Well, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, new opportunities and challenges for wastewater reuse webinar. I'm very happy that everyone is here. Uh, my name is Caroline Herten. I am the communication officer for the European Water Association. Um, I see that people are still logging in, uh, but we'll start. Um, so I'm very happy because today we had more than 300 uh, registration. Uh, so I'm very happy that everyone is here. We have people coming from all over the world. So thank you. I hope it's not too early or too late for some of you. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, our speakers for agreeing to be here today as guests. Uh, but I also would like to thank uh, IFAD Munich and Messe München uh, for allowing us to kick off today uh, IFAD uh, by doing this webinar. Um, IFAD is uh, the world's leading trade fair for uh, water, sewage, waste, and raw material management. Um, it will take place from May 30th to June 3rd uh, in Munich. We will be there, we'll have a stand, um, and we will also uh, do a lot of activities. So we hope that you come see us and all the exhibitors that are coming. Uh, because we are official partner, uh, we are giving you a free guest ticket. Uh, so you can use the code EVA when you book your ticket um, and you can uh, enter the pay for free. Um, you already receive all this information per email, but please don't hesitate uh, to contact me if you have any question regarding this. Um, and we hope to see you at IFAT uh, in, yeah, in two weeks. Before we start, I wanted to give you a few information of uh, who is the European Water Association. Uh, we have a lot of new um, participants today, uh, so I thought it would be a good idea to give you a small overview of what we do. Um, so we are an independent, non-governmental and non-profit organization dealing with the management and improvement of the water environment. Uh, we have members now from nearly all European countries uh, as national association, but also corporate members and research members. Um, and the aim of the European Water Association is to provide a forum for the discussion uh, of key technical and policy issues in Europe. Uh, and we do this through conferences, webinars like today, workshops, meetings, special working groups of experts, and through publications and media. Uh, you can find a lot more information on our website. Uh, you can also send me an email if you want to have any information on how to become I'm a member, I would be more than happy to answer you uh, and uh, would be very happy to uh, count you as a member. Before we start, uh, I want to give you a small uh, organizational information. Um, on your side uh, of the panel, uh, you can uh, write a question on the question tab. Um, please write the name of the speaker if you wish to ask a question and the presentation has already be uh, uh, already passed. We'll do a Q&A session after each presentation and another one at the end of the session. Uh, we already have almost 100 participants, so we'll do our best to answer uh, most of the questions, but uh, we might not uh, have time. Um, in every presentation, you will have the email of the speaker, so if you have any additional question we didn't answer, feel free to write an email to me or to them and we'll be happy to answer you. Uh, you also have flyers that are available to download in the heads up tab on the side. You have our program for IFAT, the code for IFAT again, uh, and a lot of information. So please free, feel free to uh, download everything you have. Um, and then you will receive after the webinar today all the presentations per email. So don't worry, you don't have to take notes, uh, take notes on everything and we will send you everything afterwards. And now I'm very happy to uh, introduce our uh, moderator, uh, Professor Jiri Vana. Um, you can turn on your camera so that people can see you. Uh, I'm very glad that you are here today uh, and you are joining me uh, for this webinar. Now we can see you. Uh, so Professor Vana is a professor of water technology at the University of Chemistry and Technology in Prague. Um, he's the head of wastewater treatment and use group of the Department of Water Technology and Environmental Engineering. And he's also the speaker of wastewater treatment and reuse group of the Czech Water Association, a member of EVA. And he's also a long-term member of the European Technical and Scientific Committee of the EVA. Uh, and we are very happy to count him uh, as uh, in the EVA family. Um, he's also acting in the International Water Association. Uh, and his research activities focus on technologies that allow the reuse of treated uh, wastewater as a substitute for river or drinking water. Uh, but I'm happy today that he's not only um, our moderator, but he will be also presenting and giving us insight. So welcome, um, and Professor Vanna, I will now give you the floor um, 
to introduce, uh, to welcome everyone and introduce uh, then our first speaker. Again, thank you, Caroline. Uh, it's a, for me, it's a great privilege and honor to moderate uh, this workshop. And uh, I can uh, add to the invitation of uh, Caroline to visit the IFAD that uh, IFAD is uh, truly uh, experienced. I was visiting uh, IFAD for many years. The first IFAD I attended was in 96, and since that time I uh, could observe how the quality of the exhibitions is improving, and this is really uh, the largest uh, world trade fair in the environmental technology. And especially this year, and it's very good that we have this workshop oriented at water use. If you look at the uh, program and the brochure of the IFAD, you will see that uh, water reuse and in generally the circularity is the environment will be a big issue many companies will be ex, uh, exhibiting their products technologies and uh, the german water association which is uh, a natural partner of this uh, traditional uh, ifat of trade fair together with eva will be also organizing some guided tours which are oriented mainly at the circular economy and what we use. So this will be a, really a very interesting event and if you are still not decided to go, I can recommend you to visit uh, IFAT Munich uh, this year. Now, uh, our topic today is uh, water use uh, uh, taken from different aspects. But uh, as you will learn during the uh, webinar, uh, the safety aspect is always the biggest issue in uh, water reuse schemes. And that's why we are starting also with the first presentation, which was uh, prepared by Dr. Uh, Roberta Maffetone. And the topic of uh, her lecture is the water reuse regulation especially the current status of the development uh, uh, for the guidance uh, of, of the risk uh, management in the agriculture use of uh, uh, reused water. The European uh, Regulation 741, which was accepted in 2020, will come into force in, uh, next year. But this year, in June, uh, the European uh, commission will issue uh, guidance how to work with this uh, regulation and the main issue of this guidance will be again the uh, safety and the health risk management and that's exactly the topic of uh, the next presentation. I would like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Maffetone. She is working uh, as a scientific project officer at the European Commission's Joint Research Centre in Italy. And this is exactly the centre which was very much involved in the preparation of the water use regulation number 741. And she has gained a lot of practical experience uh, from both academic positions and also industry in wastewater technology, in disinfection, which is a big uh, part of the uh, uh, risk plans, uh, the other technologies. So I think uh, Roberta is exactly the right person to speak about this topic and I would like now to give the floor to her. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Professor Wander, for introducing me and uh, thank you to uh, the EWA for inviting uh, uh, me as a um, um, a speaker uh, during uh, for this seminar and uh, as an open up with an open presentation on the work that we have been done uh, on the on the water use regulation so i will uh, show my screen and i will start okay my presentation and i can see I believe you can all see in a full screen. Yes, we can see the presentation. All is good. 
Okay, okay, I will leave it uh, like this. Okay, so um, good afternoon, uh, everybody. And as uh, uh, I was just mentioning, uh, the focus of um, my presentation is uh, on the work on the water use regulation that the Joint Research Center has been uh, done uh, so far um, to uh, develop uh, a guidance uh, for the application of the regulation and more specifically um, for the implementation of the risk uh, management plan that is required by the regulation when a water use scheme is, is used for, the, uh, for agriculture and irrigation. I will uh, give a um, um, very small introduction of the uh, Joint Research Center, what we are doing. Uh, the Joint Research Center is a, is a department of the European Commission and is the Commission Science and Knowledge Service, uh, um, which provide um, scientific uh, evidence uh, through, uh, throughout the whole uh, uh, policy uh, cycle. So who, the, the, the JRC, which is also uh, um, named the EU, uh, science hub, uh, scientists and researchers uh, uh, carry on uh, any type of research uh, to provide independent scientific uh, advice and to support the European uh, policy development. Uh, the directorate I'm working for is uh, uh, Sustainable Resources, which is located in the research center uh, uh, in, uh, in Ispra, Italy. There are other four research centers uh, uh, located uh, through, uh, throughout um, all over Europe um, and uh, gives uh, uh, support in the areas of agriculture, uh, rural development and, and environmental uh, challenges uh, as a whole. And my team is in the unit uh, Water and Marine Resources, um, is considered the Water Lab and um, those are uh, the main uh, uh, elements, the main people working uh, uh, on the team. I'm, uh, I'm the one involved in the water use uh, um, field, but we are also uh, working in other projects uh, um, in, the, in, in the specific now. Uh, we are very busy on, uh, what is the, on, the, on a project on wastewater surveillance uh, um, for, for COVID. So after a small introduction of uh, our team, um, I'll jump on the uh, on the water use regulation. I'm uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, every everyone knows uh, what we are talking uh, about uh, the water use regulation, uh, which was published in uh, in 2020. Uh, will uh, uh, is uh, is in force and uh, the rules will apply uh, on uh, uh, next uh, June, so June 2023. Um, the regulation was developed uh, within uh, several uh, um, European goals, uh, mainly uh, in, the, in the circular economy action plan and the European within the European Green Deal, uh, and also in the uh, in, in the view to uh, reach what is the uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal on on water, the SDG uh, six. Um, is focusing the regulation is focusing to address water scarcity and drought uh, while uh, safeguarding public health and the environment. Um, it uh, um, it is supposed to um, unlock uh, few investments and also to increase uh, the, the the water use uh, in uh, in all Europe um, from from the actual 2%, uh, percent, you can reach the 6% of uh, uh, wastewater that is uh, uh, actually produced uh, can, will, be, will be reused. Um, the main provision of the water use regulations uh, are the minimum requirements uh, that have been set for water use in agriculture and irrigation, uh, but also the introduction of uh, uh, mandatory requirements for the development of a risk uh, management plan for each uh, water use system uh, in order to uh, ensure that the water is reused for agriculture and irrigation um, in the um, in a, in a safe uh, way for, uh, for both the health and, uh, and the environment. Uh, the regulation also introduces a system of uh, permits and, and compliance uh, uh, checks um, and also try to, to foster transparency and, uh, uh, and access to, uh, to the information. But what is uh, um, 
the the joint research what what the joint research center did um, to support the application of the of the regulation um, the main activity of the center is the development of uh, guidance or guidelines um, one main deliverable is a, um, a technical a scientific and technical report um, on on risk management for agricultural irrigation uh, in the in the European Union which uh, will be um, publicly available um, in the next few months, uh, but also supported some of the um, elements that they are required uh, in the regulation itself. Um, um, that needs to be um, published by the European Commission for the implementation of the regulation. In the specific, uh, the Article 11 uh, mentioned um, that the, the Commission shall, in consultation with member states, establish guidelines. Uh, these guidelines they will be uh, published soon um, uh, under uh, a document that is named Commission Notice. And other uh, uh, documents that are required by the regulation is uh, a delegated act uh, that uh, uh, will uh, um, specify uh, the key elements of risk management that they are set out in the, in the annex two of the regulation. And uh, later on, an implementing act that will, will lay down detailed rules regarding the format and the presentation of the information. Other support that the JRC is providing is the general promotion on, uh, on water use in Europe and the collection of, uh, of best practices. So when we say guidelines, uh, as I just mentioned in this uh, in this slide, that we have uh, a JRC technical report, uh, which uh, uh, will be um, a scientific technical document, and the Commission notice will be that will be a, a document published in the official journal of the European Commission um, uh, in. Uh, in about a month, so we expect the publication, as the regulation said, by 26 uh, uh, of June. So these main two documents are what we intended as guidance or, or guidelines. Uh, the development of these uh, um, two documents has been uh, um, particularly um, uh, participative uh, with uh, the um, um, involvement of uh, the member states, of representative member states, of several uh, several experts uh, and, and also stakeholders. Um, it uh, has been done all over uh, a year and, and a half uh, with uh, different uh, um, working groups uh, and uh, technical workshops and meetings uh, with uh, specific water use uh, uh, working groups. Um, here there is a, um, a timeline. So we started uh, a year ago exactly with uh, uh, JRC uh, technical workshops on risk management where uh, um, several case studies from, from member states have been uh, presented and uh, it, it was a, a good opportunity to share uh, knowledge and, uh, and uh, on, on, on risk assessment. Uh, then we had uh, meetings with the Water Use Working Group where we discussed the, uh, the, the draft of the two guidances and we collected comments and, and feedbacks. Um, at, at this stage now, uh, the, the Commission notice uh, the guidance is uh, just passed an inter consultation from the, uh, from the other department of the European Commission and will be published uh, in, uh, in June or between June and, and July in the official journal of the European Commission. In parallel, the JRC technical report will also be uh, published uh, approximately by this September. So those are the content of the of the two documents. The Commission notice uh, mainly uh, gives uh, uh, an indication of how to apply uh, several parts of the of the regulation. Uh, the technical aspects are those that have been developed uh, by JRC, and in, sp in the specific, uh, the key elements of the risk management presented in the Annex Two. Um, it reports also, also example on the application of the Table A of the Annex One, which is uh, um, 
um, the, the table that uh, um, gives indication of how to select the water quality classes depending on the type of crops, but also gives indication and example on how to apply barriers for specific water quality classes. Um, those uh, examples that were uh, developed according to ISO um, standards. Um, it will also present some examples and a protocol for validation monitoring uh, that is required by the regulation. And it will have uh, plenty, we will have some uh, annexes with the examples on how to identify hazard, how to assess the risk for body health and the environment, uh, mainly qualitative me methodologies, and also example on preventive measures and, uh, uh, and uh, communication and emergency protocols. The JRC technical report um, is, uh, was based on established guidelines and standards, uh, like the WHO guidelines, the Australian guidelines, and also uh, the uh, ISO standard uh, for, the re for the use of wastewater in agriculture irrigation and other uh, uh, projects uh, um, developed uh, with, under the Horizon program, for example, the DemoWare project. Um, has a similar content of the Commission notice um, and will include more but with more details on examples of uh, uh, both qualitative and semi-quantitative and quantitative uh, um, risk assessment for um, health and uh, also uh, environmental risk assessment example uh, for example on on fresh water resources um, it, it's more detailed than the commission notice and it will also include the 14 case studies that have been developed during uh, the, our uh, um, um, technical workshops uh, and uh, the case studies uh, will have uh, uh, different uh, type of examples uh, on different aspects of the of the annex two uh, for the risk management plan and here uh, uh, these are the overview of the water use uh, uh, case studies that you will find in the JRC technical report uh, that have been collected uh, all over all over Europe and uh, uh, just for the last uh, couple of minutes of the presentation, I will give uh, uh, a bit of overview of what uh, you, will, you will expect uh, from these uh, guidelines. Uh, in the JRC technical report, the risk management plan um, for the development of the risk management plan is um, there is a, a suggested approach in uh, dividing uh, the key uh, grouping the key elements of risk management in different modules uh, each module addressing a specific part of the of the plan from the description of the system uh, to the um, as to the methodology on how to assess uh, the risk, how to identify additional uh, requirements, uh, uh, requirements that are additional to the minimum requirements uh, um, asked from, from the regulation, um, examples on, on monitoring programs uh, to, to better manage uh, the risks. Uh, there will be uh, some suggestion of uh, how to identify uh, hazard and uh, to uh, and uh, um, environments and population that they will be uh, exposed. Uh, also considering uh, um, the, um, the the context on where the water use scheme is um, is located in mainly uh, the legislation context. So we will try in the guidance to give also uh, an overview on which type of uh, uh, regulation uh, and directives or other legislation uh, should be uh, should be taken into account uh, when in the during the risk management plan we are trying to identify hazards uh, or we are trying to identify um, environments that they are uh, exposed uh, through um, the different pathways uh, with the use of the of the reclaimed water uh, for, for, for irrigation um, you will expect to have uh, um, some examples on uh, uh, risk assessment methodology, uh, qualitative or semi-quantitative. Uh, These are uh, um, some of the matrix uh, uh, that have been uh, developed according to, to, to the ISO standard and they will be included in the, um, in the guidance. On the top uh, is an example of a semi-quantitative one for uh, health uh, risk assessment. And at the bottom, um, it's, uh, um, it's a suggestion to 
to follow when uh, we when is is needed to assess uh, um, a risk uh, to freshwater on the, the risk on on freshwater resources. And uh, as I was mentioning before, that there will be uh, indications also on how to apply uh, the table one of the uh, of the annex one of the of the regulation, um, considering uh, uh, different type of crops and water quality class or the application of barriers. We try to um, to include a, a table and that could facilitate uh, how to select uh, the water quality class for a specific uh, type of crops. And this table that were uh, developed uh, considering uh, um, the um, ISO standard uh, for the reuse of uh, wastewater uh, for agriculture irrigation. This is just one of the example on how the of the table would uh, would look like. So I hope uh, I, I try to give a, a, a very a big overview of the regulation. More uh, will be included in the guidance. But for any questions, uh, for anything, I'm uh, I will be uh, very happy me uh, or my colleague uh, to to answer uh, by uh, by email. So you can connect with uh, with us with the uh, with the information that I'm providing in the in these slides. And uh, I thank you for uh, for your attention. Okay, thank you, Roberta, for very interesting presentation and also for perfect timing. So we have now uh, time for uh, questions. Uh, uh, there is still no question uh, coming into our question panel, uh, but uh, I would like to start with uh, just a comment that is very good that the European uh, Union is uh, keeping the timing of the preparation of, because uh, it was promised to have in June 22 uh, these guidelines and now the EU, EU countries, the member states will have one year to, to understand the philosophy, to prepare, to learn from the examples you were summarized in the JRC report. So I think the preparation for the uh, European regulation, regulation 741 is on a good way and uh, I hope the start of this regulation will be uh, smooth in all member countries. Uh, do you have any experience uh, around Europe which uh, how countries are preparing for uh, the application of the regulation? Do you have any co comments to that? Well, I mean, uh, there are uh, countries that they are uh, ahead, so they are uh, trying to develop their own uh, guidelines uh, already, uh, which was very helpful because uh, um, even to develop these guidelines, we had lots of uh, interactions with all the representatives of the member states, so some of them they had experiences. and. And of course, those countries that they already have uh, um, a practice in water use, uh, uh, not now, but since many years, they, they have been uh, very helpful uh, for uh, for understanding uh, the, uh, in the in the in real case scenarios how to apply uh, the regulation. Some of other countries uh, uh, they are on on still on the um, on the way to develop and to and 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 to, to develop guidelines i mean uh, one of the challenges of course is to to um more than uh, um, apply the there is a risk management plan is to identify the competent authorities i mean there are more administrative uh things that they they need to be solved uh for for a member state and they need to be identified uh, identified first but there is uh, they are all uh, getting in that direction Mm -hmm. Thank you. Because with this, we also answered to the fir first questions in our question panel. Uh, the question was uh, given by Mr. Lohau. So we can move to the question number uh, two. Uh, how uh, will be the emerging contaminants uh, reflected in these guidelines? For the emerging contaminants, uh, I mean, we 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 try to give uh, an overview of how to identify hazards, considering mm. uh, the context of the water use uh, scheme. So what we are 
trying to suggest is to first uh, uh, try to uh, have a look at uh, regulated contaminants um, and, and, and then uh, for those contaminants that they are not uh, regulated um, it's, uh, it's uh, a um, case, it's a specific case to identify which type of contaminants. We are suggesting to also refer to the uh, watch list, the watch list of that they are uh, included in the drinking water directive uh, or in the uh, water framework uh, uh, directive as a suggestion of um, some emerging contaminants that are not regulated yet but mm -hmm. uh, but we're giving indication to uh, try to character characterize the, the wastewater and and to consider uh, the local context mm -hmm. so uh, we uh, also received uh, some question which is uh, dealing with um, uh, the possibility to um, consult uh, the, the uh, case studies which you, you were using in uh, the preparation of your report, if you provide some consultation about those studies to the people who are interested in. Can you contact well, uh, the is, uh, Joint Research Center for consultation? When uh, when we will publish the guidelines, we will have the case studies, and the case studies they will have the the the, the person as a reference person that can be contact uh, for further question. We will put the mm -hmm. contact details and the authors of the case studies. But I can also be um, uh, contact and 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 put uh, you know just share the information and ask uh, uh, the specific author of the case study to 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 be in contact with uh, with anybody that is interested. There is one uh, rather very specific question uh, dealing with uh, physical chemical properties of uh, water used for irrigation. Will be uh, included also among the para quality parameters, the quality like, for example, water surface tension, which uh, is uh, guiding the availability of water to the plants. But uh, if there I read... Are, yeah. Yeah, I think I understood the question. Thank you. Uh, there is, is even in the hazard identification annex of the of the commission notice, we try to give an overview of those that we consider agronomic hazards. Um, uh -huh. Still, they are considered from the uh, ISO uh, standard suggestions, and uh, uh, the, which will include salinity, will include uh, nutrients, all these uh, uh, parameters that they may mm -hmm. affect uh, the crop production and also the, the soil, uh, the, the health of the, of the soil it, itself. Um, for other physical parameters, uh, I mean, we can we refer to 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 have a look at other. Uh, um, guidelines too, but mainly we try to tend to use the ISO mm -hmm. standard for this uh, uh, commission notice, but we'll include indication yeah. of the of the agronomic parameters. Okay, and perhaps the last question which we can uh, answer now in this session, uh, the, the question is dealing with the new technologies which will be necessary. Do you think that this uh, Regulation will uh, require also the application of some new technologies. We hope that the, the regulation will give a boost in innovation mm. uh, in the water use systems. Of course, the, the, the identification of a specific technology on the water use scheme will be um, is based on the on the risk management plant. That that's why is it now is it, is it, it's it's important and is a tool. The risk management plan in the regulation is a tool to identify uh, if. Uh, in the, in the condition uh, the, of the of the waste, wastewater treatment plant, the water is, uh, is can be safely reused, or we have other contaminants that need to be uh, removed, and this can be can be uh, identified by applying uh, the, the risk assessment and the, and the risk management. So, um, mm -hmm. so any type of yeah. new technologies uh, will be uh, identified based on uh, on a case. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we, after the break, we will have one a specific presentation on the uh, technologies for water uh, reuse and for the production of reclaimed water. So maybe we will touch this question in more details after this uh, lecture. So with this, I would like to thank you, Roberta, once again for a very nice presentation and discussion. 
and we can proceed in our program to the next presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Vanna, you are our yeah. next presentation. I don't think I need to okay. introduce you again because I already did, but I will give you the right uh, to share your screen. Yes, um, please. So you can show us your presentation. Screen. And thank you to uh, Dr. Maffetan for your presentation. It was very nice. We still had some questions not answered. Um, I will send them your way. Maybe you can answer them or we'll uh, see at the end of the webinar. Um, and now we can see your presentation, so I will leave it with Savannah. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. So uh, the, the goal of my presentation is to give you a very brief uh, overview of the technologies, uh, not only technologies, on the, uh, the conditions for water use in Europe. And I would like to give you also some examples. Uh, so let's start with the definition. Uh, the uh, Reclaimed water can be produced from different types of uh, treated wastewater, but in the more specific terms of the 741 uh, regulation, it's uh, produced from the effluent of municipal wastewater treatment plant, which is meeting the uh, parameters or the quality requirements of the European uh, Water Directive 271. Uh, that means the Product, the product must meet some quality standards. These quality standards are derived from two basic rules for water reuse, uh, for, for two general uh, rules. First of all, the reclaimed uh, water is prepared always with the quality which is fitted to the purpose of its use uh, to avoid some extra expenses. But in uh, different uh, quality uh, grades, always the product must be safe for human health and for the environment. And that's the principal condition. And to meet the, uh, this condition, uh, the quality must meet some national standards. There are some countries in Europe who already developed national standards. Now we will have the EU regulation and we have also the technical standards. Uh, uh, what are the uh, drivers which are, uh, in fact, pushing us to uh, speak about water use in Europe? Uh, first of all, it's uh, increasing uh, scarcity of water, which is uh, resulting from more and more extensive periods of uh, droughts. And uh, this is connected with the increasing price of water, both uh, natural resources and uh, drinking water. And uh, in, on top of that, we have also some, uh, we can say, political or social drivers, because the water reuse is a very nice example of uh, circularity in water sector. And um, many people in Europe already started to uh, understand that the use of drinking water, which is very expensive and precious, for certain purposes, like cleaning the roads, is just a waste of resources and money. Uh, the problem uh, with droughts, uh, Europe always uh, experienced some periods of droughts, but the first decade of our century started with several very unexpected, long and extensive uh, period of droughts, which uh, affected almost the whole continent and we, um, we are not used to see the bottom of our rivers like here on this picture. And unfortunately, this uh, tendency continues. And if you look at this uh, map of the European continent, many countries are affected at least by a low risk, but mainly by moderate or high risk. Some of them even with very high risk of uh, uh, droughts and uh, the problem of droughts in the past was usually connected with the uh, southern belt of European countries with the Mediterranean area but for example in, in 2019 Germany experienced very severe droughts also in the northern 
a part which is bordering with the North Sea and the Baltic uh, Sea. So this is no more a typical problem of the South. Uh, the countries which uh, are suffering from uh, water scarcity uh, are getting into so-called uh, water stress. We, we can measure the uh, extent of water stress by using the so-called water exploitation index, which is defined as a a ratio between the mean annual total demand for fresh water divided by the long-term average resources of the country. And again, as you can see on this map of Europe, uh, many uh, European countries are already in the position of at least low stress, but more and more are falling into the uh, region of uh, higher water stress. And uh, the predictions, the prognosis for the next uh, few decades uh, are speaking about the uh, deterioration of the situation depending on the uh, speed of the climate changes. So here you can see uh, two different scenarios how the uh, climate changes will be fast but both for the slower and even uh, and also for the faster scenarios uh, the certain part of Europe will be always in the region with uh, the increased uh, danger of drought uh, frequency uh, and they will be uh, suffering uh, in, especially in the summer season from lack of uh, water resources. On the other side, uh, on one side we have the drivers, on the other side we have some barriers for water reuse uh, in the European Union countries. Uh, some of them are connected uh, with the fact that water reuse is uh, not very traditional discipline in Europe. There is no enough uh, uh, experience with the re legislation, with the technologies. And also the companies and the municipalities, they do not know how to include the water use schemes into their business plans and business models. But what is more uh, important is that there are some uh, barriers which are very se serious and should be taken into consideration. And that's the safety of reused water, the economy, the price of uh, reclaimed water, and also the necessity to improve the perception of water use uh, among the public, because not all people in Europe are still convinced that we should use reclaimed water as an alternative water uh, resource. The potential for water use in Europe is rather big. Uh, the EU countries are producing every year more than 40,000 million cubic meters of effluents. But from this huge amount, only 2.5% on average are reused, which is far uh, below the uh, um, figures which are typical for the Mediterranean countries where the water reuse is a traditional part of the national water management. And that's why the European Commission is now talking about some goal uh, to reach at least 14% on the union average in the near future uh, for, uh, for the reuse from this total amount of produced effluent. The European Commission published some leaflets, for example, this leaflet you can download from the EU webpage, providing to the general public some basic figures about the danger of water scarcity, about the solution by water use and about the potential of uh, water use in Europe. If we look at the uh, types of water use, the purposes for which the water is used, we can clearly see a, a difference between the south and the north. While in the southern countries, most of the uh, water reuse schemes are aimed at the pr production of water for agriculture, for agriculture irrigation. In the uh, central and uh, northern European countries, there are also some other purposes like uh, industry, environment, recreation, recreation and others. Uh, I will 
just now briefly go through a few examples uh, of different use of re reclaimed water. So as a typical example of agriculture use, I would like to mention, for example, the uh, uh, Lombardy uh, in Italy, which is a very agricultural area. And this uh, area is uh, irrigated by water coming from the irrigation channels. But now the channels uh, must be uh, supplied by the effluent from wastewater treatment plants because there is no enough uh, natural water. And uh, there are two wastewater treatment plants of the city of Milan, which can uh, produce uh, uh, together almost uh, 30 cubic meters per second of reclaimed water. And this water, after uh, very uh, sophisticated treatment and disinfection is distributed to the agriculture. In 2016, the European Union published uh, guidelines on integrating water reuse into water planning and management of the individual countries. And this document uh, helped to start also uh, the water reuse in other areas, especially in the urban water management. Uh, the, Guidelines recommended to replace drinking water in the aeration of urban green spaces, in the recreation like golf courses, in um, road washing, firefighting, etc., by reclaimed water. One of these uh, examples of multi purpose uh, water reuse can be mentioned the example of the city of Barcelona which uh, built uh, in uh, the beginning of this century a very sophisticated uh, uh, wastewater treatment plan here in this area. And step by step, this effluent was uh, uh, used for some production of reclaimed water of different quality. And the reclaimed water is used for uh, enhancing the flow in the local river in the distribution it's distributed to the uh, irrigation system for greenery, uh, agriculture. But what is very important also, part of this effluent is further treated by rivers osmosis and is used as a hydraulic barrier of the local aquifer against the penetration of uh, seawater. Uh, one of uh, very nice examples of how the uh, municipalities are thinking now to save drinking water just really for drinking water purposes and not for the other uh, purposes is the uh, municipality of stress cantos close to Madrid, uh, which is a very nice dwelling area in uh, the park uh, region and uh, the Greenery in the park is now completely irrigated by the water, uh, by the reclaimed water obtained from local wastewater treatment plant. 2012, the uh, city of uh, London hosted the Olympic Games, and for these games, they built a completely new city quarter, which is now called the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. And this uh, quarter is uh, supplied by reclaimed water from a local wastewater treatment plant. And the uh, reclaimed water is used uh, uh, both for flushing the toilets in the new buildings, but also for uh, the irrigation of uh, local greenery. Later in this afternoon, we will have a specific, uh, special uh, presentation on Portugal, so I can skip those two transparencies uh, dealing with uh, Lisbon, because I suppose Jose will mention these examples. And we can just stop for a while in Ghent, where the city is doing now the revitalization of old brownfields, of old docks, and it's building a completely new dwelling areas located in a park and uh, the local wastewater will be used as a source of uh, water, energy and nutrients for maintenance of the park. And back to Spain. Spain uh, has become a great power in uh, golf courses. It's a very attractive uh, country for tourists. Uh, uh, and uh, according to the Spanish regulations, the golf courses uh, should be irrigated uh, 
by reclaimed water and for example the company Acosol which is providing water in this region of Costa del Sol is uh, supplying uh, irrigation water for 37 golf courses uh, in the region. And maybe last uh, example again from uh, Belgium, uh, the city or the town of Coxit uh, is using the groundwater from a local sandy aquifer, but during the long-term use, uh, uh, salty water started to penetrate to the aquifer and they built again some kind of hydraulic barrier which is using the uh, reclaimed water from local wastewater treatment plants after very sophisticated treatment based on the double membrane uh, filtration and the water is protecting the groundwater from the seawater. In our country, uh, especially my university is uh, uh, the main driver in uh, water use, but unfortunately uh, we still do not have any national regulation or decrees specifying the conditions for water use, so we are waiting for the European regulation if the situation changes. And uh, But still we have already some examples, I can just mention uh, two of them. Uh, we have also a lot of uh, golf courses in our country, so the water uh, which is used for irrigation is in some cases coming already from the uh, reclaimed water. And uh, Veolia uh, in Prague uh, tried to demonstrate the capabilities of uh, water reclamation technologies by brewing the beer from the effluent from Prague wastewater treatment plant, which was very successful pro demonstration project. And I will finish with uh, the demonstration project, which is now going on in our university. It's a European Horizon uh, project. And in this period, we are demonstrating the uh, safe use of treated effluent from Prague, main wastewater treatment plant for the irrigation of municipal greenery. We are developing the uh, reliable monitoring, uh, quality monitoring system, and we are using this demonstration unit, uh, units for uh, talking to the politicians and to the pu public and explaining them that, that the reclaimed water is a, a safe re water resource. Uh, we are uh, irrigating different types of greenery, grass, flowers, and some bushes. The, effluent from the plant is post-treated in this technology unit. And I would like to thank you for your attention with these photographs of a very happy bee, which is sucking the nectar from the flowers which were grown on our irrigation fields. So thank you for your uh, attention. Well, thank you for your presentation and all the great um, example you gave us. Uh, so far we have one question, so please if you have any question, uh, feel free to send them to, uh, to us. Um, so the question I have is when we make intensively use of wastewater reuse, will we miss this water in the rivers? Do you have some general recommendations? Well, uh, uh, there are some uh, balances made in many countries and uh, the loss of uh, water by uh, the use in the irrigation is not uh, uh, so important, especially uh, in the bigger rivers, because the uh, river uh, systems are connected with the uh, groundwater and if we are uh, irrigating the uh, fields, uh, the less groundwater is consumed by the uh, uh, plants. So recirculation inside the country is usually the internal uh, matter of the uh, water balance and uh, I wouldn't say that this will cause some uh, big problems in the keeping the water, uh, minimum water flow in the rivers, which is in some countries necessary because of keeping the water life in the rivers. Okay. Uh, the next question I have is, do you calculate water-related carbon footprint of water reuse? Good question. Yeah, that's a very nice question. 
And that's uh, exactly what we, uh, we are uh, trying in the uh, Horizon project uh, with our uh, colleagues, uh, not only from our university, because this is a big international project in which the colleagues from the Netherlands, uh, Norway, Italy, and from other countries are involved. And uh, exactly this will be one of the outputs of, of the project. But we can say that uh, um, the, uh, rule, uh, the uh, water reuse is to a certain extent uh, uh, reducing the carbon footprint of the whole water cycle because we are uh, using less energy for pumping and treatment if you compare it with the treatment of, for example, of the uh, river water. So okay. if we want to produce the same amount of water from a river water, we need more energy. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question I have is how, at what frequency, is reused water quality assessed for microbiological contaminants? Are there any guidelines yet? Yeah, uh, the European regulation uh, 741 in uh, uh, the appendix number one has a, a, a table or two tables which are requiring the uh, microbiological or giving the microbiological quality parameters. And one table is also uh, uh, defining the frequency of sampling. And uh, there are two types of sampling. One uh, type is uh, the regular sampling where, when the frequency is, I think, once in two weeks or something like that. And then uh, some uh, sampling where the, the project is starting. So when we have to confirm that all the treatment units are working perfectly. So for this uh, startup of the system, there is uh, frequency. Uh, much uh, higher of the sampling. For example, we in our project in, in Prague, we are sampling the microbiological quality every second week. And you can say that uh, both the raw effluent from the plant, which we take as an influent to our unit, but also the products from our units are very stable as far as the microbiology quality is concerned. So I would say two weeks uh, period is enough. Okay. Um, I have two more questions. I think we have time until the next presentation. Uh, why has it been difficult to develop national policies and regulations for water reuse in a Czech Republic? What are the lessons that can be learned from that work so far and used in other contexts? Yeah, that, that was a, a, a traditional, uh, that, that was a tra question of the tradition of Czech water management. Uh, where uh, 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 the management in the past was based on building uh, the huge water reservoirs. So we are the country of uh, uh, water dams. And uh, the tradition is uh, reaching to the end of the 19th century. But what happened uh, during the last 20 years with uh, the changes in the uh, intensity and frequency of rains these uh, artificial lakes and dams proved not to be sufficient uh, source of water in, in, in the summer. And that's why we came with the idea to uh, involve also the water use in the national balance of water in the country. And this is the matter of the tradition and there is uh, some uh, time which will be necessary to change it and we hope that the regulation of the European Union which will come into force next year will speed up this change. All right, well thank you. And the last question I think before our last presentation, uh, what is the name of the Horizon project? Is there any info online? Yeah, yeah uh, the, uh, pro the uh, complete name of the project is the wider uptake of uh, uh, smart water solutions and there is a web page uh, which you can find under this name and you can find a lot of information on the web page and uh, the web page is operated by Norwegian company uh, Sintef so if you 
put into the Google, for example, wider uptake hyphen Synthev, you will get directly to the web page. Great, thank you. Well, thank you for your presentation um, and thank you for all the example uh, you gave us. Uh, we still have one question, but I think we'll go back at the end of the of the webinar. Yeah, um, I will be here, so it's no problem. All right, then um, I'll leave you then present our next speaker before our small break. Yeah, so uh, our next presenter will be Dr. Josef uh, Leinsteiner. Hello, Josef. Uh, Hello. Uh, he has uh, almost 40 years experience in water reuse and water reclamation, so he is a really very experienced expert in this field. Currently, he is the uh, Technology Research and Development Director of Watek Wabak, which is a a company uh, acting globally in water technology and at uh, the same time currently uh, Josef is uh, the leader of the water, International Water Association Specialist Group on Water Reuse and this uh, group is organizing uh, a specialist conference on water reuse and I think he will also invite us for the next uh, conference of this group. So, Josef, now the floor is open for your presentation. Thank you, Yeshi. I will start with the drivers for water use. First of all, water shortage caused by climate change, population growth, urbanization and industrialization in developing and emerging economy. All four issues apply in the city of Chennai. Then there are ec economic reasons. Used water or wastewater is a drought proof resource. There is a lower freshwater demand in some countries reduced wastewater discharge fees and there is the option of resource recovery. A very important driver is boost in water supply security. Imagine drinking water supply or industrial supply cannot be maintained. Drinking water supply can, uh, if it's not maintained, can cause political problems. So I imagine a refinery sh is shut down would be very costly. Last but not least, policies, regulations and guidelines. For example, the reuse of treated wastewater policy of the Indian state of Gujarat issued in 2018. Facts of Chennai. It's located in the southeast of India on the Gulf of Bengal. It's the capital city of Tamil Nadu, fourth largest city in India, population 7 million in Chennai city, 11 million in the metropolitan area. It is one of the world's fastest growing economies. It is the automotive hub of India and further major, major industrial products are textiles, petrochemicals, fertilizers and electronic hardware. The average annual rainfall is 930 millimeters. However, mainly in the monsoon month. Chennai, Chennai's water demand is up to 1200 million liters, megaliters per day. Groundwater abstraction is in the range of 100 to 120 MLD. Four major surface water treatment plants supply 630 to 850 MLD. There are two seawater ROs with capacities of 100 
and 110 megaliter in operation. A 150 MLD seawater row is under construction. And there are nine sewage treatment plants with a combined capacity of 727 MLD. The coverage rate in Jena is 95%. Reclaimed water for industrial, industrial reuse, it's um, 10%. Currently, it has been 10% of the total water demand. And you can see in 2016, it was 4%. So there is quite a, there was, there has been quite a development in, in the last few years. Urban reuse is only on a small scale, 1.3 megaliters per day for various purposes, but an increase is to be expected in the next years. Indirect portable reuse IPR is an option. There are two pilot plants under construction, two pilot plants with a capacity of 10 megaliters per day each. In 2019, there was a very severe drought. The summer monsoon appeared to fail. It was the worst drought in history. The freshwater reservoirs were empty. There was a state of emergency comparable to Cape Town. This was also three, four years ago. Drinking water had to be supplied by government tankers and even by train. Drinking water was transported by train over a distance of 200 kilometers. And even hospitals had a lack of water. And only emergency surgeries were performed. Reuse of treated wastewater policy for Tamil Nadu was implemented on 29 November 2019. The vision of this policy is that the use of reclaimed water provides sustainable water management leading to circular economy. This includes also energy recovery, energy uh, recovered from, from municipal sludge digestion. The objectives are sustainable water management among industries, agriculture and domestic consumers, the provision of reclaimed water to major industries, including power plants, industrial clusters, special economic zones, etc. Uh, another objective is the facilitation of reclaimed water for urban purposes, such as fire protection, toilet flushing, landscape watering and gardening, car washing, etc. And uh, the encouragement of surface and groundwater augmentation. This would be indirect portable reuse, IPR. The Chennai Metropolitan Water Supply and Sewerage Port has taken the lead in adopting water reclamation projects. The raw water for reclamation is provided mainly by two sewage treatment plants, the Kodungayo sewage treatment plant, the Koyambedo sewage treatment plant. Um, secondary effluent in Kodungayo is reclaimed and then reused in the Chennai CPCL, Chennai Petroleum Corporation Limited Refinery, 24 MLD in Madras Fertilizer, 10.5 MLD in the Manali Petrochemicals Limited, 1.5 MLD, and the Koyangedu Kodungayu Water Reclamation Plant gets also the raw water from, from this sewage treatment plant uh, in Koyambedu. And this reclaimed water is um, supplied to, to various industries in the Manali area. The Koyambedu's water reclamation plant uh, 
supplies water to, to various industries in the southwest of Chennai in an industrial area. Indirect potable reuse, as mentioned, two 10 megaliter pilot plants are under construction at Nesapakam and Perungudi. Uh, the robot is also municipal secondary effluent. Uh, residual ammonium is removed by sequencing batch reactors, then uh, polishing by multigrade filtration, ultrafiltration, granular activated carbon filtration, ozonation, and it is planned the upscale to 240 megaliters per day in order to meet in the future the growing drinking water demand. The first case is the Koyambedu water reclamation project. It's reclaimed water from municipal effluent for the reuse in various industries. Um, this reclamation plant located here in the west of Chennai. Uh, the aim is to boost the overall water supply security by industrial reuse. These reservoirs can be fully saved for drinking water production. The reclaimed water is supplied by a 68 kilometer pipeline system to this industrial area. And here the, the main industry is the, the automotive industry. Um, key facts, it's a DBO project, design, build, operate, capacity 45 MLD, startup was end of 2019. O&M contract is over a period of 15 years and the process is a resilient, advanced, multiple barrier system. A simplified process flow diagram, secondary effluent from the Korean Bedu switch treatment plant, first chlorine dioxide dosing for pre-oxidation, pre-disinfection and sand filtration, another oxidation and disinfection step by sodium uh, hypochlorite, then ferric chloride dosing upstream to ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis desalination, upstream a cartridge filter of 10 micrograms, micrometers, uh, degassing tower, ozone disinfection and distribution to various industries as mentioned. The major design parameters, total dissolved solids in the robot are 1500 milligrams per liter, reclaimed water less than 70, milligrams per liter, very important for industrial reuse, is silica, raw water 40 milligrams per liter, reclaimed water less than 5 milligrams per liter, current values, that means in the average value in April was only, and that's very good, 0.6 milligrams per liter. And uh, here you can see the ultrafiltration process unit from Inge, reverse osmosis, unit from Dow, and this slide shows the beneficiaries uh, who are getting this reclaimed water. It's for example Yamaha, Hyundai, Royal Enfield, and uh, it's many more uh, beneficiaries. Yes, the second case, it's the Chennai Manali Water Reclamation Project. Reclaimed water is reused in the Chennai Petroleum Corporation Limited refinery. And uh, it's a refinery with 9.5 million metric tons per year. The major products are LPG, motor spirit, and so on. Simplified process flow diagram, secondary effluent from the Kudungayo sewage treatment plant. SPR treatment in order to have nitrification, then uh, coagulation, flocculation, high rate clarification, disinfection, two stages filtration. These were existing uh, uh, dual media filters, uh, therefore um, they were integrated. Basket strainer, 100 micrometers, ultrafiltration, uh, anti scalant dosing upstream to reverse osmosis. Uh, pH adjustment, sodium 
metapisulfit in order to destroy chl chlorine, RO desalination, the gassing tower, the, the RO permeate is directly going to the cooling tower. It's reused as cooling tower makeup. And in the refinery after demineralization with two with mixed bed ion exchangers, it's also reused as boiler makeup. Some photos, secondary effluent reservoir, secondary effluent from the Kodungayu uh, sewage treatment plant, SPR, dual media filtration, ultra filtration, reverse osmosis, process surveillance by the SCADA system. Some results. Total dissolved solids in that period, 900 milligrams per liter after desalination, less than 10, less than 100 uh, milligrams per liter, so approximately 80. And silica, 22 after desalination, less than 1. Yes, uh, Yoshi men mentioned this. Uh, Chennai is also the event the venue of, of, of the next global water reuse event. It's the 13th IWA International Conference on Water Reclamation and Reuse, uh, held from 15 to 19 January next year. Call for papers open until this Sunday, until 15 May. And I would cordially invite you to attend this very exciting conference. Conclusions. In Chennai, large quantities of fresh water can be saved by mainly industrial water reuse. This boosts the over, overall water supply reliability or security which can be endangered by water stress, caused mainly by, mainly by population growth, industrial development, and climate change. The environmental impact is subst substantially reduced. Water reuse is cheaper than other options, such as seawater desalination or transport of fresh water from distant sources. Indirect potable reuse is a future option in order to cover an increasing drinking water demand. Urban water reuse is practiced on a small scale. However, an increase is to be expected for the future. The undisturbed functioning of all water facilities, particularly during a crisis such as the very severe 2019 drought, is essential. This can be guaranteed by properly designed, resilient, multiple barrier processes and prof professional own them. Finally, it can be concluded that Chennai is on the right track to, to circular economy. Thank you for your attention. Okay, Josef, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation, which uh, gives us the impression how uh, severe could be the problem of uh, uh, water scarcity and how the water use can uh, help to solve such a tremendous problem. And also thank you for the invitation uh, for the very attractive conference uh, uh, which will be held in such an attractive location. So now we have um, some time for uh, questions to the presentation. Um, Dr. Do Anshana, have... can you put back your uh, webcam because we don't see you anymore? Yes, just a moment. To answer the question, I now we can see you now. Thank you. Yeah. Caroline, can you see some questions? Because I can. Yes, I can see some questions. The first question we have is compared to the population growth in the city, how many of plants ah. need to cover the all human demands on water? Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, if, 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 yeah please read it. 
compared to the population growth in the city, how many of plants need to cover the all the all human demands on water? Um, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question either. Maybe we can go to the second question and then. Uh, the, 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 the question, I, what I understood from this question is that there is a very uh, rapid population growth. Yeah. So, uh, how many plants uh, you will uh, they will need to cover the increasing consumption of water? That's yeah. probably um, the meaning of yeah, the question. Yeah. There are not only water reclamation plants and drinking water treatment plants, uh, there are also desalination plants. Uh, Chennai has to use all sources available. Uh, mm. I mentioned a 150 MLD plant, desalination plant is under construction. And even a 400 MLD plant is uh, in the tendering stage. So there is one column is desalination, then fresh water is uh, abstracted from the groundwater, but groundwater levels we are going down, then there are reservoirs, freshwater mm. reservoirs, which are fed by rain. Mm. And, and then there is uh, water reclamation. Uh, industrial reuse saves freshwater sources for drinking water production. And I mentioned an option is, an option is uh, indirect potable reuse. That means augmentation mainly of uh, freshwater reservoirs of these lakes, and but also it could be also groundwater recharge. So, uh, and and I mentioned 240 MLD for IPR indirect portable reuse is planned for the future. So, mm -hmm. and and also the industrial water use I'm sure will be increased. So. Uh, and then and, and portable reuse, there is a, for, for portable reuse, there's a, a very big potential. So different measures, but uh, all sources have to be used. Yeah. Desalination, of course, is more expensive than water reclamation, but nevertheless, also desalination is very important. So I think that's a, a good lesson we can learn from, from such uh, examples. The similar story was with the Singapore. Uh, yeah, uh, it's similar. Uh, uh, we have two questions which are uh, very, uh, to a certain extent similar. Uh, money comes first, so they are dealing with the price. Uh, the one question is about the cost and energy consumption per cubic meter of the uh, produced reclaimed water. And the other question is exactly what you said now, asking how it is possible that the desalinated seawater is more expensive than the reclaimed water. What's the reason? Yeah, the the cost. Uh, Chennai Metro um, sells the water for 65 rupees to Sipcot. Sipcot is mm. a small industrial promotion corporation. It's approximately 80 euro cent. So China Metro uh, sells it to to Zipcot for 80 uh, euro cent. Uh, and of course, in seawater desalination, you have uh, you have much higher TDS, requiring requiring much higher pressures, mm -hmm. and in reclaimed water, you, you need perhaps 1.5 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. And in desalination is uh, three to five, uh, at least three, three uh, kilowatt hours per cubic meter. So energy uh, uh, demand in desalination is much higher. Yes, exactly, because the salinity of uh, F municipal effluent is by several order of magnitude uh, lower than the seawater salinity. That's, that's true. But nevertheless, both is necessary to, to supply. Use. 
to read to use here. Okay, so um, there is one uh, last question which we can answer right now. Uh, the reclamation schemes included a ultrafiltration and a reverse osmosis. Yes. Is it typical that still uh, up to five milligrams per liter of total solids <coughs> remain in the reclaimed water? Um, the question in 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 this Koyambedu uh, project, yeah, the, the standard of uh, for industrial reuse is is 70 milligrams per liter. Uh -huh. And and actual values are around 40 milligrams per liter. That's sufficient for, for reuse. If you have a boiler, then, then you need additionally another reverse osmosis stage or and and and, and uh, mixed bed ion exchange. A mixed bed yeah. ion exchange, yes. Yeah. But for um, for cooling purposes, uh, less than 70 and silica less than five is is sufficient mm -hmm. of course okay thank you so um, i think we can uh, conclude uh, this uh, question and answer session right after the presentation we are coming to a short uh, break uh, which uh, is now from uh, until 1535 so uh, we will uh, break the presentation for about 10 minutes and uh, within 10 minutes we will start again. You can make your uh, own tea or coffee, unfortunately we can't provide you uh, from the Secretariat, but uh, we are looking forward to continue with our wonderful uh, uh, workshop after the break. So let's be back at uh, 15.35.
So, uh, are we ready to continue? Uh, it's, yes, we are good to continue. Oh, okay, wonderful. So we will uh, start now the session by the presentation which was prepared by uh, Professor Jens uh, Haberkamp. Uh, and uh, we will learn something about the technology which is uh, used for the production of uh, reclaimed water. Just to uh, introduce to you uh, Professor Haberkamp, um, he uh, uh, got a PhD in environmental engineering from the Technical University of Berlin. And uh, he's been working for five years with uh, consulting uh, company P2M in Berlin, uh, working on many international wastewater treatment uh, projects, also focused on uh, water use. And later on, he was appointed uh, professor for sanitary engineering and water supply at the Minster, uh, Univer Minster University of Applied Sciences. And within the German Water Association, the, the logo you can see here, he is a spokesman of uh, two groups which are dealing with uh, water use in Germany. So Jens, please, the floor is open for your presentation. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Yuri. Uh, actually, do you see my presentation? Because I don't see it on my uh, laptop yeah, now. I, I can see it. Okay, so I have to change. Uh, okay. Yes, um, here we go. Thanks a lot. Well, uh, I will, uh, as uh, Yuri just mentioned, just give you a brief overview um, on uh, of different um, technologies used for water reuse and um, I am giving this presentation on behalf of uh, our DWA working group on water reuse uh, which has been active uh, now since uh, 2005 um, and uh, we are well a group of um, engineers mainly engineers uh, which uh, who are working in um, different institutions, as you see here, and also as you see on this picture, um, Dr. Lahnsteiner is also part of our group. In 2008, uh, our working group uh, published um, a so-called DWA topics, so it's a it's a report, and in this case, uh, it was a, an extended report on treatment steps for water reuse. Um, which uh, was kind of a guideline for characterization and assessment of um, different technologies that are suitable for wastewater treatment, focusing on water reuse. And um, this report has been translated into several languages. And in 2019, we published an extended and uh, yeah, a new version, a re revised version of um, this report. Uh, called non-potable water reuse. Um, the objective of uh, this uh, report is to give a general guidance for planning as well as expanding projects um, regarding um, water reuse, especially um, non-potable water reuse. Um, the focus is on the use of reclaimed municipal wastewater as an alternative um, freshwater supply for different applications. So besides um, agricultural irrigation, we are also um, focusing on other types of irrigation, such as urban landscape irrigation, as well as further urban irrigations we already heard about, such as uh, firefighting or toilet flushing, as well as industrial practices. And especially in today in um, Dr. Maffetone's uh, presentation, we already heard about uh, the importance of uh, risk management um, within the scope of water reuse. And um, there are basically three types of uh, risks related to water reuse um, due to um, specific water constituents. 
these are, of course, pathogens, but also chemicals, which may be inorganic substances, such as, uh, for instance, uh, heavy metals, uh, and also organic substances, uh, such as uh, pharmaceutical residues or uh, industrial or other chemicals. And um, the third basic hazard is the salinity of uh, reclaimed water. Salinity um, or uh, dissolved salts are, uh, on the one hand, um, they may pose a risk uh, regarding the plant growth, but on the other hand, um, of course, salinity is also um, or may affect um, the fertility and the structure of the soil. In order, uh, the, the, the objective of um, the risk management is to protect the environment as well as the public health um, with regard to these risks. Um, um, regarding the public health, um, there are the users of reclaimed water uh, which have to be protected. Users uh, such as, for instance, farm workers um, that are applying uh, water for irrigation, but of course also consumers um, of um, the farm produce and also residents and the public nearby, uh, for instance, uh, fields that are irrigated with reclaimed water um, so that they are, um, it, it has to be ensured that there is no um, drift of aerosols, for instance. Well, and the main hazard, or let's say um, the most immediate hazard um, related to water reuse is due to pathogens such as, uh, well, protozoa, bacteria, um, uh, helminths, and also viruses. And in the following, I will only focus on technologies uh, for the inactivation or removal of pathogens um, within the scope of the first or um, subsequent to the first presentation, um, there was also, also already a question um, referring to um, trace organic substances or emerging contamin contaminants, uh, which may also pose a certain risk, but um, the EU regulation mainly refers to pathogens so to hazards due to pathogens. That's why I will only focus on pathogen removal and um, emerging contaminants have to be considered within the risk management. And this may also require further technologies for the removal of those contaminants. Conventional wastewater treatment um, includes um, mechanical and biochemical uh, removal of oxygen consuming uh, organic substances as well as uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. And um, the secondary effluent um, is then usually discharged into a receiving water body such as a river. If the, uh, the water deriving from the wastewater treatment plant shall be reused, further treatment is necessary. So there is uh, the necessity of some kind of advanced wastewater treatment. And then um, the um, reclaimed water has to be distrib distributed towards uh, its further um, application, uh, which may also include uh, some kind of storage. So I will now focus on advanced treatment for pathogen removal, but uh, you always have to keep in mind that in, in order to ensure uh, the proper quality of the reclaimed water, the conventional secondary treatment has to be carried out in a very reliable way. So the water quality of um, um, of the secondary effluent is of basic uh, importance for um, any further treatment. If we take a look on uh, pathogen concentrations in um, 
wastewater, municipal wastewater, uh, for instance, in terms of fecal coliforms, uh, well, we see that the conventional treatment process only removes uh, one to two uh, orders of magnitude of um, these bacteria. So even sand filtration is not able to um, significantly reduce um, the bacterial or the pathogen concentration. Um, and in order to keep um, the standards, that are required by the U European regulation uh, for different uh, quality classes, um, some further disinfection is absolutely necessary. Such a disinfection stage can be um, either a physical separation of pathogens and uh, we already actually uh, just saw several examples in terms of uh, physical um, disinfection, that is uh, membrane filtration in the, in, in the uh, process flow, flow schemes um, that uh, Dr. Lahnsteiner just uh, showed us. Sand filtration and microscreening may reduce uh, protozoa and um, helminths and their eggs, but um, they don't remove um, bacteria and viruses reliably, or even not at all. The second kind of uh, disinfection is uh, chemical inactivation of pathogens, uh, which may be done by ozonation, chlorination, or other chemicals uh, such as parasitic acid. And of course, there is uh, electromagnetic inactivation, um, that is achieved by UV radiation. So let's have a look uh, first at uh, physical separation processes. Um, on this diagram, on this uh, picture, you see um, well different kinds of uh, wastewater constituents um, related to their size, and also different. Um, kinds of uh, physical separation processes, that is different filtration technologies. In terms of advanced wastewater treatment or um, physical um, removal of uh, pathogens, um, we are usually talking about low pressure membrane filtration, that is microfiltration or usually ultrafiltration. Um, by, uh, by these membrane processes, um, protozoa and helminth eggs, but also bacteria and, um, at least in case of uh, ultrafiltration, also viruses are removed simply due to size exclusion. Um, of course, membrane filtration uh, requires um, certain amounts of energy. And as we already saw in, in the process diagrams um, that Dr. Lahnstein showed us, also um, um, a certain kind of pretreatment in order to ensure the membrane filtration process. I just mentioned that uh, ultrafiltration and membrane filtration are uh, mostly used in terms of advanced wastewater treatment, uh, but this is always um, a question of. Um, the further purpose of application. So if you need a very high water quality, for instance, uh, with, with regard to industrial purposes or even uh, drinking water production, then high pressure membranes, uh, such as nanofiltration or reverse osmosis membranes may also be required. Sand filtration, on the other hand, is a um, well-established um, filtration technology. Um, which is usually cheaper than membrane filtration. But as I already mentioned, um, only protozoa and helminth eggs can be reliably removed from the wastewater or the, the secondary effluent, um, while bacteria and viruses are not removed. So in order to really achieve uh, reliable disinfection of the reclaimed water, an additional disinfection stage is uh, necessary, which might be UV disinfection. On the other hand, um, um, 
sand filtration stage prior to UV disinfection or other kinds of um, disinfection significant, significantly increases the efficiency of the subsequent disinfection stage due to the removal of uh, particles. Microscreens or micro sieves are a newer technology uh, for the removal of particles. Their removal efficiency is quite comparable to that of sand filtration. It depends uh, on the mesh size of the micro sieves. And um, in terms of micro sieves, uh, it is of special uh, importance that uh, uh, the ceilings of the micro sieves are always intact so that there is no uh, shortcut for. Um, pathogens. In terms of chemical disinfection, so regarding chlorination or ozonation, for instance, um, that is all. Uh, it is always a question um, of the concentration um, of the disinfectant and uh, the contact time with the disinfectant. So the so-called CT concept applies. And as you see, um, with um, increasing product of concentration and um, contact time, um, the inactivation of um, the pathogens decreases after an initial lag phase, which is due to the initial reaction of, uh, for instance, chlorine with um, dissolved water constituents. And of course, disinfection is also um, depending on the type of microorganism that is the target. So uh, application of chlorine gas or also sodium hypochlorite um, is a well-established technology uh, which has been uh, applied for decades, um, but uh, it is only efficient at uh, yeah, up to uh, slightly basic uh, pH values. Uh, during chlorination, um, there is the formation of uh, potentially harmful disinfection byproducts out of uh, dissolved organic matter. Uh, and chlorine gas, especially chlorine gas, is uh, also a hazard for the workers and also for the public. But chlorination is uh, quite cost efficient and chlorine provides a residual disinfection capacity. So also after the disinfection stage, uh, as long as there is a residual chlorine concentration, there is also a certain security against um, regrowth of bacteria. Chlorine dioxide has a higher disinfection efficiency, especially uh, with regard to protozoa. And it's independent of the pH value, um, but it has to be produced on site because it's, because it's an unstable gas. And this also holds true for ozone, which has a higher disinfection efficiency than chlorine, but uh, which has also to be um, produced on site. And in contrast to chlorine, ozone doesn't provide any residual disinfection capacity because it is quite rapidly uh, consumed. It's, it's because it's very unstable in water. In terms of, um, well, radiation or um, uh, UV disinfection, um, the inactivation is done due to um, the damage of the DNA. So in case of um, chemical disinfectants, uh, well, they are destroying the cells or um, structures within the cells by oxidation and UV radiation um, destroys the DNA, therefore, um, well, um, affecting or stopping the proliferation of bacteria. Especially in terms of UV radiation, it is very important uh, to have a very low um, concentration of suspended solids uh, so that um, there is no shielding of bacteria um, from um, the radiation. And um, in order to achieve uh, high um, disinfection efficiency, um, sufficient irradiation intensity is needed under very controlled flow conditions.
So what you see here is an example from Berlin um, where the water flows this way through three benches of uh, these uh, UV lamps. Um, yeah. And um, in terms of UV disinfection, there's no um, uh, formation of disinfection byproducts, but on the other hand, there is the potential regrowth of uh, bacteria that may survive the disinfection stage. So I just, uh, just towards the end, I, I just want to um, uh, point out, um, well, again, our um, DWA topics on non-portable water reuse. We uh, prepared um, an assessment matrix uh, for assessing um, well different uh, combinations of treatment steps in order to achieve uh, certain um, treatment objectives, always focusing on water reuse. So we uh, considered uh, physical separation processes as well as physical chemical disinfection processes. And uh, the objective of uh, this assessment matrix is to provide a fast and uh, very simple support for the suitable, uh, uh, the uh, choice of suitable um, um, treatment uh, technologies for um, uh, the production of reclaimed water. We considered 27 different kinds of uh, treatment processes, which are here at the uh, head of this matrix. And um, we assessed each of these uh, treatment technologies with regard to uh, a var var variety of um, different criteria, for instance, health risks, um, effects on the environment, um, requirements in terms of personnel or staff, operating staff, uh, but also, um, of course, uh, focusing on the type of reuse. And this uh, matrix is meant as a decision support uh, basis for further detailed and site and plant specific uh, engineering investigations, which are always necessary. So all technologies uh, for um, production of reclaimed water have always be tailor-made regarding um, the type of uh, application. So actually what you saw just on the, oops, on the last slide uh, looks like a traffic uh, light matrix. This is just to give a very simple overview. The matrix itself looks like this where um, a variety of uh, quantitative parameters are given and assessed. So here you see um, the treatment technologies and the different criteria, assessment criteria. And you can download um, the Excel uh, this Excel file um, from the DWA website for free. So to conclude, there is a variety of uh, technologies uh, that ensure the proper quality for the use of reclaimed water. But as I said, um, the quality of uh, the secondary effluent um, is, uh, or a good quality of secondary effluent is mandatory or prerequisite uh, for um, the further production of reclaimed water. Treatment technologies can only be one component within a multi-barrier system. So you, have, you also have to um, focus on, for instance, uh, the, the ir irrigation technology and, um, uh, well, further irrigation practice and so on. Our DWA topics on non-potable water reuse, uh, we are not only focusing on treatment technologies, but also other aspects such as regulatory, ecological, social, economic, and energetic aspects uh, considering water reuse. And um, we already heard from Dr. Maffetone that uh, in the European um, countries, there is quite a lot of uh, activity with regard to the implementation of the European regulation. And um, we within our DW a working group are currently preparing a German technical rule um, for the implementation of this regulation. 
So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jens, for a very interesting technical presentation. Uh, I, I think I, I would like to stress uh, one idea you mentioned during the presentation, and that's whatever type of the um, uh, water reclamation technology we are using, it must be preceded by very stable uh, and reliable biological wastewater treatment or secondary wastewater treatment. Because the treatment technologies which are used for the production of reclaimed water can cope with the variation big variation in the water quality. Uh, and that's, that's a very important condition. Uh, I can see some questions. I think the first question, first question which, was, uh, which is dealing with the removal of uh, element uh, X, you already answered during the presentation because the question was, what is the best technology? And you showed some uh, low pressure membranes, for example, as a very reliable technology for the Helmin X uh, removal. Well, if you want to add uh, something. Mm -hmm. uh, membrane filtration, of course, is um, a very reliable technology for Helmin X removal, but since Helmin X, um, well, have diameters or have a size from um, uh, 10 micrometers or more, I guess. Even sand filtration and micro sieves, if you choose the right um, mesh size, um, provide a very efficient means for the mechanical removal of Helmet X. Mm. Then uh, I have one uh, question, uh, question which is more terminological than uh, technical. If you can uh, explain why you included the UV disinfection among uh, the electromagnetic methods, because the questions, uh, the author of the question considered that the use of magnetic waves is uh, something different than the use of the UV uh, light. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> Finally, you show the, the principle how the UV acts, and the, the main answer to this question is that this is the uh, UV light is very high energy uh, uh, irradiation, and this high energy uh, of this light is vibrating the bounds between uh, uh, this uh, um, nuclear acids, and this is why they are broken. So this is the energy input. From the exactly. UV light. Yes. And uh, one more question from the same author, Yekaterina Markilova, ask you uh, what is your opinion on disinfection by cavitation or inductance or uh, some uh, application of electromagnetic uh, fields? Oh, actually, I, I don't have any experience uh, in terms of these applications. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry that I can't answer that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Maybe one more comment to the UV disinfection. Uh, as you pointed, and I would like to stress it also once again, that the UV disinfection is acting uh, at one moment uh, now. And if we have some uh, system which is uh, uh, containing also distribution and storage of the uh, reclaimed water, then uh, we have to think about some additional disinfection. And that's why the, the, the European uh, regulation brings this very important concept of the point of compliance between the producer and the final user. And uh, everybody is responsible to the point or after the point. And especially after this point of compliance, uh, they should uh, use some disinfection on the net. And for this purpose, I would uh, say that this is uh, the, the uh, use of peroxo acids seems to be very promising because they are not producing any harmful chlorinating byproducts. Yes, you're right. Or even application of again chlorine because yeah. chlorine has a has a residual effect. If you if you add yeah. it uh, with as as 
with the as low as uh, possible doses, uh, you may also um, reduce the production of disinfection byproducts. But you are perfectly right. Um, uh, if you think about storage of reclaimed water prior to application, or if you have to store it for a certain time, um, you you in many cases or most cases you can't do it without the further disinfection stage. Uh, uh, I think there's a very similar story to the drinking water distribution systems because we have also the chlorination on the net in the accumulation towers etc. So it's uh, the, even though the drinking water plant is equipped with some high tech like ozonation there should be chlorination on the net. Okay, Not always, so, but it, yeah. <laughs> but some uh, sometimes it's necessary. Yes. Yes. We can return to some more questions if uh, they come to your presentation in the final question and answer session. And now it's time to proceed to our final presentation, which uh, will be given by Professor Jose Saldanha Matos, my good friend from Portugal. Uh, he is uh, currently the professor at the University of Lisbon at the Department of Civil Engineering, uh, Architecture and Geo Resources uh, of the School of Engineering. He has been president of uh, Portuguese Water Association for many years. He was also president of the European Water Association. And currently, he is the president of the Portuguese Water Partnership. Uh, uh, he has many, many years of experience in uh, projects in water supply, wastewater collection and treatment, and now also uh, water reuse. And uh, we can switch to your presentation. So, just that the floor is open for uh, your very interesting presentation, and please. You can start. Okay, uh, thank you very much, dear Giri Warner, dear Caroline, dear colleagues of the webinar, dear participants. Uh, at first, I would like to thank the organization for the invitation and, of course, congratulate the, cho the choice of this team. Opportunity opportunities and challenges for wastewater reuse, it's really uh, a hot topic. And uh, I have to confess that I have too much slides for just. 15 minutes. I have 26 slides, so I will skip some of the slides, but the information will be there and can be after the, the webinar. This information, this PowerPoint presentation can be shared with some, some additional information um, that overcomes that uh, I will present uh, now. So, I will speak about uh, reuse at the city scale, the Lisbon Waste, Wastewater Reuse Master Plan. There are a master plan for wastewater reuse at, at all, covering all of Lisbon, and some of the works are in place and are operating. I will speak a little, about, a little bit about the potential consumptions, the design criteria, the proposed solutions and phasing, the hydraulic modeling, the investment estimate, and afterwards a little bit about the works in place. And finally, this final considerations. As you know, Portugal is a Mediterranean country. It means that although the, the, the average rainfall is higher, for example, 900 millimeters is more than United Kingdom, for example, and for other regions of Europe, but there are regions in Portugal, like in Alentejo, in the south principle, where it just rained the average of 400 millimeters. And the problem as a Mediterranean country is that is the rainfall pattern is very irregular in terms of space. So in the north, you have a lot of rain. In the south, you have no rain. And in terms of temporal variability, in some period between TPO between May and October, the rainfall is just a few rain. You have just a few rain. So it means that, uh, that uh, you have uh, a lot of events of droughts. One of our serious droughts, it was five years ago in 2007, even in the north of the country. And this figure that uh, shows uh, the drought situation in, in Portugal, so that last uh, last month, April, March in April, the situation is that the, all the country was in moderate or severe drought. 
in droughts are one of the main driving force for wastewater reuse, for wastewater use. It means that there are in Portugal currently a lot of uh, a lot of initiatives in terms of uh, wastewater reuse. Uh, the strategic plan for water reuse of the Lisbon city, so for all the Lisbon city, was developed some years ago for the utility man that manages the bulk water in the bulk wastewater in, in system, and after for the Lisbon municipality. Uh, the population of Lisbon is around half a million, but of course uh, you have um, uh, you have tourist touristic uh, population. You have a lot of people coming from Lisbon for services. It means that typically each day is more than one million. And the main objective of this master plan is to is to to develop studies in order to fulfill the requirements of the city in terms of urban cleaning, so it means of road washing and so on, and irrigations of the parts of the city. So it means that in the city of Lisbon nowadays you have a lot of parks, so you have um, a lot of uh, hundreds of hectares of of uh, gardens. And of course, you have a lot of roads. So all the benefits related with water reuse, supply of natural fertilizers, not dependent on climate uncertainty and in Portugal, he suffers from this uncertainty, suffers from climate change. And uh, to release the water with right quality for human consumption is also important because you have a certain pressure on, on sources and water bodies. The main source is is far from Lisbon, is more than 140 kilometers far from Lisbon, is Castelo Border Reservoir, and you have a lot of pumping, and you have a lot of resources, still the water uh, arrives to Lisbon. So there are a lot of economical, social, and environmental benefits. And you have, of course, in Lisbon, a lot of potential irrigation of green spaces, industrial cooling proposals in EK is an industry that is already into place, uh, road washing, uh, washing of equipments and vehicles for construction. So these are potential uses of wastewater. And in fact, in Lisbon and I think that in other cities, water quality and safety is far most the critical factor. Isn't, you have not problems in terms of availability. It means that the three treatment plants in, in Lisbon, so the average flow is around the total is around is more than two cubic meters per second and if you have storage tanks along the the city for accommodating the difference acting as a buffer you can fulfill all these all these uses for for road washing and for and for irrigation as far as you have these these distribution lines and as far as you have these storage tanks of course then for developing the master plan, you have to take into account the regulation, the EU regulation about water reuse, of course, of 2020. And you have also taken into account a Portuguese regulation. Of course, then when the Portuguese regulation was developed in 2018, the, the draft of the EU regulation was, was already in place. So we follow the same approach, the fit for purpose, the multi-barrier approach, the risk evaluation and management plan, all these requirements, all this information and the issue and production license or permits. But this, this Portuguese adaptation includes not just irrigation for agriculture, but includes um, requirements for other uses, not just for agriculture, and includes issuing permits, not just for use, but uh, uh, also for use and not just for production. So, and you are applying that. And this is one of the one of the three treatment plants of Lisbon. This is the major treatment plant. It's is the this is you you can see in the figure the green cover is I think it's the 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 larger green cover in, in, in uh, Peninsula Iberica with uh, almost three hectares. Of course, all this green cover is, is irrigated with, with, uh, with uh, wastewater, with treated wastewater. But the treated wastewater of our country is also used in other places. Um, and of course, this is an, one of the other uh, treatment plants, Bayrolas, 
and Bayrola Shellas and and and, treat, and the Alcantara is the three sources of treated wastewater for the living city. And of course, for contenting this 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 master plan, you have taken into account the places where you need the water for irrigation. All this is in 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 was supplied by the municipality, and all the this these volumes most are for gardens. For green, green, for green spaces, almost 50 percent, 20 percent for street washing, and uh, and the other for the other consumptions. And you have here the balance for for the street washing, other applications like in the port of Lisbon, uh, in the metro facilities, in the sports stadium of Sporting and Benfica, airports, amusement parks, in Carriage for the birch parks private farms and gardens. So there are a lot of potential that you take into account. The design criteria like, is like a, 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 a water pipe system. So you have to take into account the losses, the minimum in motion in maximum pressures, the velocity criteria for cleansing and for avoiding extreme head losses. And of course, you need storage volumes for buffer. So in these decentralized water storage tanks in the city, you have planned for 12 major tanks, and all this is very important. And of course, in emergency situations, the tanks shall have the possibility to be supplied with water from the public network, of course. And the problem in the, the questions of safety here are, are very important. So you you all these storage volumes have the the possibility of cloning of coordination also. So all these you have three phases: a phase one for short term, a phase two of medium term, and a, a, a phase three covering all the city for the long term. And of course, for that you have applied the hydraulic model and the racing simulation for different scenarios for the current phase for the future, take into account all this scenario of consumption and of availability. Of course, you need also not just storage, but you need pumping systems all along the system. And uh, but take into account the investment, just of course, just the investment for transport is around 16 million euros. So it's not it's not so much. It's something that can be recovered when we when you when you use this type of the three to start instead of the, the water from Castel de Bot. And some works are in place. Some there are lines uh, for downtown, with of course uh, storage volumes, with the pipes and the hydropressor system. You have these examples of Park das Nações. Park das Nações in the in in the in the east part of Lisbon uh, is well. It was the first system with the with the with the permit issued by the Portuguese Environment Agency. Of course, that was after two years of discussion. But is what was it? It was very very recently open to the public and uh, with uh, with irrigation from from Beirolas. And of course, that before that there 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 were pilots. You have also this. Ikea, in the case for the cooling purposes, they use the wastewater from Frielas for that purpose for, for long, for more than two or three years. And you have Parque da Bela Vista also, where take place the rock in Rio. So this, this work, these works are put into, into place. And, and of course, all around Portugal, in the south, principally, there are also initiatives for irrigation of golf courses. Golf courses are are are, are Great demand in, uh, need need a lot of water, and uh, and in, in in the south you have problems of shortage. So the the use of uh, treated wastewater is is no doubt a, a good solution. This is also something that you have to compete with the with the check with the Checo uh, beer. So Vira in Portuguese we call Fern is a artisanal beer created by the utility Aguas Terra Atlantic. And plus it water mines. Water mines is this concept of treated wastewater. Water mines is water plus, huh? with additional treatment to ozonization and reverse osmosis, is intensively controlled. But every water conference, every technical visit from foreign people to, to Alcantara treatment plant or to Berola's treatment plant, 
the pe people, the visitors have this beer for free. So, uh, and, and it's very, very good. So it's a, it's a value branding product of, of, it's one of the products of, uh, of the wastewater reuse. So final considerations. This strategic plan has three phases. Water will be supplied, the sources are the three treatment plants, and you have 55 main water mains, so 55 kilometers of water mains, 16 pumping systems, 12 storage volumes for this irrigation of green spaces, more around 200 hectares for urban cleaning also. So I think that this alternative water source is making Lisbon City more sustainable in respect to water, more resilient, better adapt to climate change scenarios. And I think that uh, in other cities of Europe, this is also occurring. So thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Professor Vanna, we don't hear you. Um, I think your uh, mic is not on. Wait. Now we should be able to ah. hear you. Yes, now ah, we wonderful. hear you. Wonderful, because I was muted by the organizer. Uh, thank you, uh, Jose, for a very interesting presentation, because uh, uh, exactly uh, the examples you showed us uh, will be very useful for the promoting of the idea of uh, water reuse in other European countries, because uh, you clearly showed that when um, the authorities, the municipalities, take seriously the problem of uh, looking for some alternative resources, that wastewater can be considered as a very safe and stable resource. That's very important what we, for example, found during the uh, uh, long drought periods in 2000, uh, 14 2018 that the urban wastewater treatment plants were uh, probably the most stable water resources yeah. because people are always using water the water was provided by the water uh, utility companies yeah. to the households and people use uh, the water and produce the wastewater so we didn't observe any significant decrease of in wastewater production during the uh, summer droughts uh, at this yeah. period it's true. It does depend on climate change. Yeah. Yeah. So I can see some uh, other questions here. Um, there is a, a, again uh, one question from Ekaterina Markelova. It is a good ambition to go free of wastewater by 2030 for other countries like Spain. So do you think uh, they will follow the example? I, I, I think so. So I think that the, the really driving force is this is this drought in the climate change and the urbanization. So it means that um, I think that is is a is a, is, a, is a tendency that uh, doesn't occur just only in Europe, but even in, even in Asia, in America, in Africa, as far as, as, you, as you have problems of water shortage, wastewater reuse will be a solution. Yeah. And even when you have not commonly water shortage, it's important to give resilience to the city. So it's important that the city has alternative sources and one of these sources, one of the cheapest sources, is the wastewater reuse. But of course, that you need to control to be safe. And in the in the example I, I, I've told you, it was two years of discussion uh, mm -hmm. between the health authorities and between the environmental agency and between the utility before issuing the license. Uh, but uh, it, it was, uh, I think it was a, a, a very important process. Mm -hmm. uh, in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, the reclaimed water, when it's uh, distributed to the place of the use, 
it uh, uh, needs to be stored in some places to cover to the top consumption, the big consumption. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the question is, does the store uh, water need further disinfection? So do you consider some further disinfection in the storage tanks? Yes, really, really. We consider chlorination because in fact, the, well, the, 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 the volumes of the storage tank are not so great, but should ensure at least between six and 10 hours of storage. So it means that uh, uh, you, you need to ensure this, you, you need safety. So it means that you need really coordination in this, in this, in these points. And yeah. these are planned. I agree. We, we have a very similar experience from uh, the uh, demonstration units we are operating at the wastewater treatment plant of Prague, where we are testing different types of disinfection, like the combination of different membranes and UV, etc. But once you get a perfect product with almost zero bacteria, after two uh, hours of storage, you will it's find true. it. Because first, uh, it's very difficult to keep the uh, water absolutely uh, in an airtight condition, so it's a contamination coming from the air. And then the other factor could be, as was mentioned by Jens, that uh, some of bacteria which are very uh, illuminated by the UV light can recombine uh, the exactly. DNA after some exactly. time. So exactly. uh, there are two sources of uh, yeah. bacteria. Yeah. And you have the, tra the travel times in the rising mains also. So it mm. means that you have a, you have yeah. Travel time, and also you have the time in the in the in the in the tank. So you, you definitely need some chlorination, uh, some disinfection step at the end. Yeah. So we are almost at the end of uh, the time which was uh, scheduled in our program for our uh, workshop. I can't see any more questions in our uh, question panel. So I would like to thank you once again, Jose, for a very interesting presentation. I hope we will okay. uh, see soon in Munich. Okay, and you'll see, you'll see. I will know. gives me another opportunity to invite again uh, our participants or the participants of our today's uh, workshop uh, to Munich. Uh, for the IFAT uh, exhibition, uh, trade fair, for the discussion with the people uh, present there, but also uh, European Water Association will hold in cooperation with IFAT the traditional water symposium. Maybe uh, Caroline uh, uh, ha uh, has prepared some uh, program to, to, to show Yes. Or, uh, I wanted just to invite you because this water symposium will be dealing with many hot topics of the current water management in Europe, also including the circularity, uh, but not only in water, but also in sludge. Because during the workshop, there was one question uh, dealing with the sludge. We, we didn't include the sludge on the topic of the workshop today, but the, the uh, sludge reuse is uh, one uh, of the uh, big issues, which is also uh, covered by the symposium in uh, Munich. So I think I can uh, give you the uh, uh, word back to, to Hanef and you can conclude the uh, workshop. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you to all the speakers. But we didn't have any more questions. We answered everyone, so it's great. Uh, but I want to thank uh, everyone uh, for being here today, uh, for giving us insight and information. Uh, if the participants still have questions, please send them my way or to the speakers directly, and we will be happy to answer them. Uh, but I think it was a very successful event. We learned a lot. Um, so thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. If anyone wants to add anything, please feel free. Well, then I thank everyone. Uh, don't forget, uh, you can uh, book your ticket uh, for IFAT by using the code EVA. Uh, we'll be there, so come see us. We'll be mm -hmm. at the entrance of uh, 
Paul West. Um, like um, uh, Professor Vanna said, we have uh, the symposium, which will take place on the 1st and 2nd of uh, June. We have amazing speakers coming from all over the world. Um, so you have to join us. Uh, we also have on the 31st of May, the Eva Devia Innovation Workshop on surveillance of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and its variant in wastewater, which is also a hot topic in the moment. So we all hope to, um, to see you there. Uh, you can follow us on social media where you can get all the information about our events, our members' events, uh, anything you need to know. You can find everything on our website, also all the links, um, every event we do, what we do with our members. So please check that out. Um, and you can also sign up to our newsletter, uh, which is sent every two months uh, with also great content and information directly from Brussels, from our members. Um, so feel free to sign up. Um, when you leave the webinar, you will be asked to ask uh, to give a quick feedback, and we'll be very grateful if you could take the time to answer a few questions, uh, so it will help us get better for next time. Um, and I really hope that everyone has a nice um, had a nice time today. Um, I wish everyone a nice evening or morning, depending where you are, because we have people from everywhere. And uh, so thanks again, everyone, uh, and I hope to, uh, that uh, we will see you in Munich. Okay. So, goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.